Welcome everyone, it's Professor Steve here, and um, after going over the benthic environment and the source of energy or organic matter input to the benthic environment, now we can go over the organisms that live there. So guys that, that essentially that consume the, the organic matter and the energy inputs. Um, they can be broken up into um, several different ways, but the first way is whether they're small or large. Um, there We have our microbes, and these are our prokaryotes. Uh, like bacteria and archaea, and then we have also uh, protozoa, and then we have our invertebrates. Um, and a lot of these guys play much the same role that we're familiar with already in the water column, uh, just in a little bit different way. And we call them, whether or not they're small, microscopic, and we need a microscope to see them, we call that microfauna, meaning you know tiny organism, or macrofauna. Um, and these guys, again, are very diverse um, and many different uh, size ranges and and types and species and roles. Uh, just a quick recap of the sources of the benthic energy, um, organic matter input to the system for consumers to to well consume. Um, and the first big over over uh, reaching one is primary production, just like in the in the water column. Phytoplankton do it in the water column by floating around. But on the benthic environment, we have benthic microalgae, which are much the same types of species, right? Diatoms, dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria, um, that are doing primary production. So they're fixing carbon in the form of CO2, turning it into organic matter, using the sunlight to do it, and so are the benthic macroalgae. Uh, whoops, that's supposed to say macro, which means large algae. Um, and these are our seaweeds, so our large kelp forests, our red and green uh, kelps and algaes, and our sea grasses. Um, and that, those, are the, those are the two main primary production um, um, inputs of organic matter to the benthic environment. The second one, and this is to the majority of the benthic environments because the, the primary production um, inputs occur mainly in the um, intertidal zone, so close to the coast because the sunlight can only penetrate to the shallow depths of the ocean and most of the ocean is deep. So the majority of the rest of the seafloor gets its organic matter by sedimentation. So we have in the ocean water column or up in the surface where the sunlight occurs, we have phytoplankton fixing carbon, we have consumers consuming the phytoplankton, we have um, this accumulation in this particulate organic matter pool that sometimes through sinking and, and migration we can get to, to the deep ocean, and then it settles and sinks through a process we call sedimentation to the seafloor, and that is organic matter input to the benthic environment to the benthos. So it's not primary production directly. It's important to remember. The other way we can classify the benthos is whether or not they live on or in the seafloor, right? So if they are epi, that's on top of fauna, so organisms on top of or on the seafloor, they're epifauna. And if they live in or below the seafloor, inside the sediments, then they're called in fauna. That's simple enough. So the first class of, of consumers is the prokaryotes, just like in the water column. And we talk mainly about the bacteria, but of course archaea are in there as well. And one of the biggest uh, primary differences in, uh, <coughs> in the prokaryotes and the benthos compared to the water column is their concentration. If you remember we said in the water column an average is about 10 to the 6th or 1 million bacterial cells in every large drop in every milliliter of seawater. And the benthos is a pretty wide range that starts way above that, 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 11th cells. So that's an average, it averages about 10 to the 9th, was about a billion cells of, of bacteria and archaea um, per milliliter of pore water. So pore water is the space in between the sediment particles. And so that's a very highly concentrated uh, abundance of prokaryotes, of bacteria mainly. Um, and they do mu they play much the same role in the benthos as they do in the water column. They recycle nutrients, and whoops, sorry. And this is the big one, right? They are the only guys that can consume dissolved organic matter. All organisms, all organic matter, all enter all OM input to the seafloor is the same as in the uh, water column, and eventually it ends up as dissolved DOM organic matter. Um, and bacteria are the only ones that can use that. Prokaryotes are the only ones that can use dissolved stuff so that it can be mobilized and consumed by uh, higher trophic levels. 
The other difference is these last two. And diagenesis is the formation of sediments um, by the metabolism of prokaryotes, of, of primarily bacteria. And so each bacteria has its own type of metabolism, and they change the sediments, they change the organic matter they're consuming and the mineral particles around it um, into, this, into a different kind of, or it's what makes the sediment what it is, and that's called diagenesis. Um, and it is the way they do that that determines whether or not the organics that they're interacting with become buried or completely removed from the system. And I'll describe that a little bit more here. So I don't want you to get too wound up by um, the intricacies of, of this figure right here, but it suffices to say that each one of these steps in this ladder here is a different type of bacterial metabolism in the sediment, right? So here's the seafloor level right here, and as we go down this way, we're going deeper into the sediment. We have primary productivity, so micro, ben, micro benthic, uh, sorry, micro and macro algae, um, benthic guys that make primary make uh, that do primary productivity and we have sedimentation the two different types of organic matter input to the benthic environment we have bacteria that take it up in its dissolved form now primarily bacteria or would like to use oxygen to breathe oxygen and I use that term lightly because they don't breathe the same way we do but they use oxygen to burn to make their energy and to respire the carbon Right? That's the most energetically favorable way to, to do your metabolism is to use oxygen. Right, So oxygen diffuses into the sediments. Bacteria use it to degrade this organic matter. Once the oxygen runs out, as we get deeper into the sediment, the oxygen can only penetrate so far. And once it runs out, so once the bacteria have used it all up, deeper in the sediment there are bacteria pro and other prokaryotes that can use, that can breathe nitrate, quote unquote breathe. Right, nitrate to do their metabolism. As you go deeper, and nitrate runs out. You have, you find some bacteria that can breathe manganese. As you go deeper, they can breathe. There are different organisms that can breathe iron. And each step, they're degrading and changing this organic matter, this original organic matter, and all the mineral particles and other elements like nitrate and phosphate and all the other particles are changing it with each metabolic step. As you go deeper, they can breathe sulfate, and deeper, and finally, they can breathe. They can breathe and create methane. Um, and these are the least likely, or the least energetically favorably. This is a very hard way to make your living, but there are organisms, bacteria, that can do it. Um, and so, once we get below this level, nobody else can use the organic matter anymore. It's become deeply buried, and we call that deposition. So, no, once nothing can use it, it's deposited. But really, my favorite way to say that is burial. Um, so, this is completely removed from the system. Nobody can use it anymore. And that's important, we'll get to that in a minute. So the second level consumer is pretty much the same guys as in the water column, and that's protozoan bacterivores, so guys that eat bacteria. Um, in the benthos, um, it's primarily ciliates. It's very few uh, flagellates, but it's primarily ciliates. There are some other, uh, there are some amoeba and the flagellates, but ciliates are the big consumers, and they do basically the same job as they do in the water column. So let's start to paint this picture of how they fit into biogeochemistry in the, in the benthic environment. So we have our two organic matter types of sources. We have primary production by micro and macroalgae, and we have organic matter sinking or sedimenting to the seafloor, eventually ending up in this dissolved organic matter pool. Um, the dissolved pool is taken up by bacteria, and it grow, they grow more bacteria. The bacteria are consumed by ciliates or, or some other protozoa just like in the water column and just like in the water column and every every other environment on earth so we would call this sort of the microbial loop of this food chain um, there's recycling that goes on these guys respire they excrete they die and are decomposed and are recycled and they can kind of self feed this this biogeochemical cycling it's the same thing with the ciliates they respire they excrete they uh, die and decompose and they can be recycled now the key is some of it is not recycled. They can't possibly take care of all of it. Anything that is not taken care of, so there's some of this original organic matter is never taken care of from primary production or sedimentation. Some of the organic matter locked up in bacteria is never taken care of through diagenesis. Some of the organic matter that becomes ciliates is never taken care of. And it's ultimately buried beyond this point, right? So nobody else can use it anymore and we consider it buried. 
When I say buried, I mean removed from the system. And if you remember, in the deep ocean, if we remove organic matter to the deep ocean, we're talking about uh, about a thousand years um, removed from cycling. When we talk about buried in the sediments, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. So a very long geological time scale, and that's significant. Because if you remember, this organic matter and this organic matter originally was CO2 from the atmosphere and from the land and once upon a time it was and once it becomes here once it makes it through diagenesis and through all these cycles and is buried it's removed for hundreds of thousands of years and that's significant for things like climate and the cycling of carbon the next level of consumers is essentially the same next level as in the water column right we call these guys harpactacoid copepods but i don't care that you know that name but just know them as benthic copepods right they're capable of feeding on the ciliates and the microalgae in the in the benthos and if we plug them in here right we have organic matter that's through this chain and recycled and if it's not it's removed through burial um, refractory just means hard to chew on right it's, it, it's organic matter that nobody's using so it's removed um, and if we add in the copepods they can ha add to this recycling or they can add to this removal and burial of organic matter And so from here on out, it's just um, the same story with, with larger and larger organisms. Um, but the next group are the larger macrofauna consumers, um, which are generally broken down into suspension or deposit feeders. Now, uh, most of the deposit feeders take the form of worms or, um, or other uh, <coughs> guys that crawl along here and consume things as they go along, or filter feeders like bivalves and certain other types of worms. So if we look at these guys, these are uh, four different ways of making your living as a worm. Some of these guys turn their stomachs inside out around prey and just digest them on the inside and bring them back in. Some guys are actually hunters for with uh, using obvious methods like, like pinchers. Some guys are scavengers. They crawl along the floor. They use these tentacles to reach out and grab particles and consume them. But they're consuming the entire... Uh, sediment and stripping it of its organic matter and then some things are, are scavengers they just crawl along and look for things even as large as a dead fish to grab onto and and consume so those are scavengers and deposit feeders filter feeders um, here's an example here this cocoa worm and this is another kind of wor uh, tube worm over here and they just stick out their appendages and let them filter water out of the out of the water column so as particles go by they're trapped in these tentacles and they bring them in and consume them and then we have other things like like barnacles that is a filter feeder and they can uh, or or things in the clam family and like barnacles have this uh, filter feeding appendage um, that they swing through the water and, and filter particles out of the water with. And then there are bivalves like clams and, and oysters and you're going to watch a video after this lecture um, to see just how they work. And then the next level up are the top predators. So these are the larger fish, sea stars, and crustaceans and they go around eating all the um, essentially deposit feeders and filter feeders and they all add to the efficiency and the biogeochemical cycling of benthic organic matter in the same way right so we have this whole same story here whatever doesn't get used and recycled gets buried and if we add the macroorganisms all the filter feeders the deposit feeders and the top predators they do the same thing they either consume each other consume somebody down the line when they do they either respire, excrete, or die and decompose and add to recycling, um, right, this part would be our microbial loop, this would be transfer up the, tr up the food chain out of the microbial loop, and then we slowly transfer up to the larger organisms, and whatever is not recycled in this way is removed through, the bu through burial. Once it's removed through burial, it's organic matter that's removed for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's important to remember because it's removed from biogeochemical cycling. Now, the efficiency of how this is done um, has, has an impact on how much is removed, right? So if these guys are very efficient at their metabolisms and very efficient at recycling, so high efficiency equals high recycling, right? Just keeps feeding the food chain and it does not get removed through this burial. But if we don't have a long food chain and we don't have high efficiency of recycling within this group, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later, we have low efficiency, then not as much gets removed through burial on that long time scale. 
Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next lesson.